I love books. And not only do I love reading them, I love just holding them. Like, I love looking at the front cover and reading the back. I love like just flipping through the pages. Like, I'm a numbers person, so I love looking and seeing how many pages there are and how many chapters there are. I love imagining reading it. Like, I love books. Um, and you can see evidence of this uh, in my house. We have a lot of books. And you know what's even more embarrassing? When I look at this, I, I see the empty spaces. I see potential for more books. And you see, I especially love owning a book, even though it would make so much more sense for me just to borrow books. You see, almost every book I only read once. I almost never read a book a second time, and then when I finish reading it, I put it on my shelf, and it sits there for all time. And we also have this thing called libraries, and I actually looked it up. There are seven libraries, seven free public libraries within 15 minutes of my house, where you can borrow almost any book you want, and if they don't have, if, there's, if the book I want is not in those seven libraries, they have this thing called interlibrary loan where you can request a book and it, in a few days, shows up at your library. Like, it doesn't make sense for me to own books, but like, let me tell you, I love a book even more when I own it. <laughs> I do, I do. So I want to ask you, maybe you resonate with this. Maybe it's not books for you. I don't know, maybe it is. But we as humans love owning things. We do, even when it makes more sense for us to borrow it. My kids, I've got four kids, five and under, and they even grasp this. Because one of the very early words for them is mine. <laughs> and uh, so much so that Hannah, my two-year-old, is really struggling with this. Like, she's not sharing. Instead of sharing, she's saying mine and hitting. OK. And I'm concerned. So I talked to her teacher about this. And I said, I'm a little concerned. Hannah's not very good at sharing and taking turns. And this is what my teacher said, oh, really? Good, that's great. That means she has ownership. I'm gonna check that off on our developmental list. <laughs> See guys, ownership is so ingrained in us that it's considered a significant developmental milestone in toddlers. We love being owners. But you see, I think God has a better plan. He doesn't want us to be owners. He doesn't want us to see ourselves as owners. He wants us to see ourselves as stewards. And I've got a definition of stewardship for you. The careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. And I love that word, entrusted. You see, because everything we have has ultimately been entrusted to us. Everything we have, our time, our talents, our treasures, not just our money and our material possessions, but also our kids our spouses, our friends, our talents, everything we have has been entrusted to us. So in this series, we're gonna look at, we're gonna take a deep dive and look at what does it look like to see ourselves as stewards? And not just what does it look like, but how do we shift our attitude of one of an entitled owner to a humble steward? So will you go on that journey with us? And today, I'm going to start by talking to you about what it looks like to be a good steward of our time. And to do that, we're going to read some words of Jesus. So would you open up your Bible with me to Matthew chapter 25? And I'm going to read for you verses 31 through 46. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? This is Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. 
I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed, for into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and the angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So we find this passage at the end of a two-chapter discourse, 24 and 25, and it starts off with Jesus teaching about signs and warnings to look for in the end times. And then Jesus goes into a couple parables that talk about what it looks like to wait for these end times and what it looks like to be ready for it. And then he finally ends this discourse with this, an image of the final judgment. Now, and he uses an analogy for this. He uses the sheep and the goats, and this would have been a really easy to understand analogy at the time. You see, because shepherding was a very common profession, and they knew a lot about it. And it was very common for shepherds to, um, it was very common for shepherds to bring together the goats and the sheep together. And um, we see at the beginning of this passage, I'll go ahead and talk about this, we see the Son of Man coming in on the clouds. This is how he opens up this passage. The Son of Man comes in his glory. And the reason why I wanted to talk about this is because this resonates closely with a vision that Daniel has in chapter 7. And what's so cool is Pastor Tim preached to us about this just two weeks ago. And so we see these two verses and they look We can see the resemblance there. And here's another really cool thing. Jesus refers to himself in this passage as king. And that might not sound significant, but Jesus hardly refers to himself as king. And in this vision of Daniel, we see the son of man approaching the ancient of days, and the ancient of days gives him a kingdom. And here in this passage, we see Jesus referring to himself as king, and he is giving the sheep inheritance to an eternal kingdom. I just think it's so cool here that Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy from Daniel. So we see Jesus using this analogy of the sheep and the goats. And we see them separating the sheep, the sheep he puts to the right, and the goats he puts to the left. This would have been an easy to understand analogy because shepherding was very common in this time period. And during the day, the sheep and the goats would be put together. And I think it's pretty easy to tell the difference between a sheep and the goat. But in this region, the native sheep and goats actually looked very similar. And I have a picture. I feel like it's pretty easy to tell the difference. But I feel like you can also see that they do look kind of similar. And if you were looking at a herd during the day and you were far off, maybe you wouldn't be able to discern where the sheep and where the goats are because they were very similar in size and they were very similar in coloring. But the shepherds at the end of the day would separate out the goats from the sheep because the goats could not withstand the cold of the night, but the sheep could. So seeing Jesus using this as analogy would have been extremely easy to understand. So we see Jesus putting the sheep On the right, the righteous ones, and they're given an eternal inheritance. And then we see that Jesus is putting the goats on the left, and they are given an eternal punishment. 
Now, for those of us who have been Christians for a long time or maybe are really understandable, like really understand the Christian faith, we're not surprised by the idea of this final judgment. We've heard of it before. We know it's going to happen. But I'm going to tell you a major theme in this passage is surprise. See, the sheep were surprised. The goats were surprised. And I was surprised when I read this, and I wonder if there are some of you who are surprised when you read this text. You see, we see that the sheep are put on the right, and they're surprised, but they're not surprised that they were put on the right. They're not surprised that they're given an internal inheritance. What they are surprised by is the reason. So let's look at the reason the sheep were given. Here it is. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, I, you, and you, I needed clothes. I was sick, I was in prison, and you helped me. And this is what the sheep say. When? When did we do that? Notice they don't argue that they're on the right, but they, they argue the reason. When did we do that, Jesus? And this is what he says. The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And this is the part I'm surprised by. I'm surprised by what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, you know why you're on the right? Because you asked me into your heart and you chose to follow me. That's surprising to me. Instead, what he talks about is their actions. You know why I put you on the right? Because you took care of the least of these. Because you had, throughout your life, you had all these acts of service towards those who needed it most. That's why you're on the right. And I'm going to tell you, that's surprising to me. Okay, so let's look at the goats, because the goats were put on the left, and they too are surprised for the reason. And this is what they say to Jesus. They say, can you put that slide up, please? This is what they say to Jesus. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needed clothes or sick in prison? Now, I, wanna, I underlined the word Lord, because this is very alarming to me. Do you see that the goats called Jesus Lord. They know full well who Jesus is, and they are proclaiming Jesus as Lord. But where are they? They're on the left. That is very alarming to me. And you know why Jesus put them over here? It's because of their actions. No, no, no. Let me rephrase. It's because of their inaction. Because they did not do those things. So they're not over here because they did a lot of bad things. They're over here because they didn't do the good things. Whew. Okay, more alarming I'm going to throw at you. This passage doesn't have anyone in the middle. There are no shoats and there are no geep. <laughs> there are only sheep and goats. There's no one that he says this to. You know, oh, you're a tough one. You really loved me. You did. You asked me into your heart, uh, but you didn't do a whole lot. But like, you still loved me, so I'm, I'm going to put you in the middle. No. He put everyone on the right or on the left. And I'm going to tell you, when I read this passage, this is what I want to say. Jesus, what's going on? What's going on? Because I know this isn't right. Like, I know we aren't saved by our actions. I know that. So what are you saying here? I don't know if I like this text. And you know what I'm tempted to do? I'm tempted to say, eh, this doesn't agree with my theology, so I am going to ignore it. I'm going to read really quickly through it, because there's got to be a mistake. But do you hear what I'm saying? Because these are the words of Jesus the Jesus that we love and follow. These are his words, so we cannot ignore it. 
And did you hear like almost the arrogance in what I was saying? Jesus, there's no way this is right because I know better than you. This is Jesus. So not only can we not skip over this, we have to put just as much weight on this passage as we do other passages. So what does this passage mean then? Because we can't ignore it. What does it mean? I think Jesus is telling us that our actions matter. And the way we choose to use our time matters. Okay, so our actions matter. Okay, I got it. So maybe we're thinking, good, so what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Okay, Jesus says, love the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. So who is that? Who, who do I need to love? I need to know what I need to do. And I'm going to tell you when I was doing my research, this, who are the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, was almost what all the commentaries were full of. So we're not the only ones asking this question. And there's actually four main opinions on who are the least of these that we're meant to love. And here they are. Maybe it refers to all people around the world in need, and that's who we're called to love. Maybe it refers to only Christians who are in need. And this, this uh, scholarly opinion comes from the fact that Jesus says brothers and sisters. And he only uses that Greek word when he's referring to his disciples. So maybe it means we're supposed to love our brothers and sisters in Christ who are in need. Um, there are other scholars that think it's more specific, specifically missionaries who are in need. And, and others say, no, 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 it, it's, it's referring, we're talking about the end times here. So it's referring to martyrs and those persecuted specifically. Okay, there's all the opinions. Who are we supposed to love? Like, what does this passage mean? I'm going to tell you, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what Jesus meant by the least of these brothers and sisters of mine. However, I think this completely misses the point. Because I don't think Jesus is saying, guys, okay, in order to be saved, you need to do this and this and this and this. You need to love people 12 times a week, and then you'll be good. Check, check, check. Because this passage isn't telling us that we are saved by our actions. It's telling us that the way we use our time matters, and our actions matter. So I think trying to figure out exactly what we need to do to be saved completely misses the point. So I was talking earlier about how the sheep were surprised, and I think that there's a lot of significance in that surprise. And I think we can learn a lot from the sheep here. You see, they were surprised by their reasoning, and that gives us a glimpse into their motive for why they did those things. See, the sheep did those acts of service not to save themselves, not to get glory. And if they had done those things to save themselves, this is what we would have seen. Jesus would have said, good job. You did all these great things. You took care of me, all those things. And this is what they would have said. Huh, tell me more. I'm awesome. But instead, they're like, when? When did we do those things? They weren't even aware that they were doing those acts of love because they were doing them just because they loved Jesus. So you guys, it's not just that our actions matter. Our motives matter too. Not only are we meant to use our time in a way that shows love to others, but we've got to be doing it for the right reason. And the right reason is because of how much we love Jesus, that we just can't help but love others. And the surprise from the sheep tell us something else. See, they weren't surprised that they were put on the right because they knew full well that they were going to be given an inheritance. What they were surprised by was the reason that Jesus gave them. That tells us that we are not saved by our actions. Our works don't save us. But here's the deal. If we are truly saved, we will show love to others. Because that is the evidence that we're saved. The proof the proof that we are following Jesus is that we show love to others, that we feed people when they're hungry, 
that we give them water when they're thirsty, that we give strangers love and support and time. We find the lonely people and we show them love. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. Our actions don't save us, but they are the evidence that we are saved. And this actually wasn't the only time that Jesus taught this. You see, if we choose to ignore this text because it's tricky, we're going to have to ignore a lot that Jesus said. Because in John chapter 13, he said, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And in Matthew 7, he says, A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good, good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So how do you know someone's following Jesus? It's by what they do. So we've got to ask ourselves some tough questions. Do my actions match what I believe about Jesus. Do my priorities, the way I choose to use the time that God has blessed me with, that God has entrusted to me, do I choose to use my, the time of his to show love to others because that is the proof that we are following Jesus? And here's a tricky one. If Christ returned today, based on how I choose to use my time, would Jesus put me on the right or would Jesus put me on the left? Am I a sheep or a goat? Because, guys, if we are truly following Jesus, our actions will match. People will know because how much love we are showing to everyone around us. But you see, we also have to ask the reverse question. If I'm not using my time to show love to others, am I truly following Jesus? Well, there's one more surprise in this text. And I think it's about how Jesus identifies himself here. Now, you remember that it opens up with the Son of Man coming in from the clouds in all his glory and being seated on the throne. And he's, he's king to an eternal kingdom. And who does Jesus choose to identify himself with? Let's see. Whatever you did for the least of these, you did for me. The king of kings says, I am the least of these. And when you do those things for them, you do those things for me. Do you see Jesus' solidarity like with, with the people who need him the most? He's saying, I have so much solidarity with them that I am them. He identifies so closely with those, the least of these, the forgotten, the least favored, the ones who live in the margins of society, the ignored, the considered less important. These are the ones Jesus identifies himself. So if we say we truly love Jesus, we are identifying with them too. If we truly love Jesus, to love Jesus means to love the least of these. So we see this if we say we truly love and follow Jesus. That's how we love and follow Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves, do I truly love Jesus? Because if we truly love Jesus, our actions and the way we choose to use the time God has entrusted to us will match, and we will be showing love to others. 
it's really quite difficult for me to stand up here and give this sermon because these are questions I have to ask myself too. God has entrusted this time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I am 33 years old. I have been given a lot of time. Am I using it the way God would like me to? Is my life bearing fruit? These are difficult questions. So maybe you're thinking, honestly, like me, maybe you're thinking, I'm challenged. I'm convicted. I look at my life, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm using the time that God, in the way that God would want me to. But, and I'm going to tell you, the staff has been feeling this, too, for ourselves. We've been feeling we have this amazing church that God has entrusted to us. Are we, as crossroads, using the time and resources in a way that would be pleasing to him? And this is a big reason why we have chosen to partner with the Church in Action in Germany. And the reason why we've been talking so much and trying to start these new communities on mission. And these communities on mission are groups of people that will come together and alternate between weeks of mission and weeks of community. And on the mission weeks, the group will go out, outside of these four walls, and just love people through projects, through needs in our community, getting out of our, our walls, getting out of our homes, and actually loving people, showing people Jesus' love through actions. And then on the next week, it's going to focus on community, where the people who serve together come together to grow in a time of discipleship, in a time of sharing your lives, in a time of prayer. That's what these community on missions are. And maybe you're thinking, this message is convicting. This message is compelling. But I don't even know where to start, Pastor Liz. I don't even know. Like, where are the least of these? How do I know what to do? This would be a great place to start. You could join one of these. This would be a great place to start. Our actions matter. The way we choose to use our time matters. But our actions don't save us. They don't. Only Jesus on the cross, through his sacrificial death and his victorious resurrection, that's what saves us. And it's an important reminder for us. We are to receive that free gift of grace of his death on the cross, and we are to respond. We receive, though we don't deserve, and we respond through his power, and we, we leave these walls, and we love. And so this morning, we're going to take some time to gather together for communion. And this is a time for us to remember all that Jesus has done for us. And it's a time for us to proclaim his free gift of grace through his death, his resurrection, and our hope that we live in him for the future. But communion is also a time in which we can ask God to evaluate our hearts and say, God, thank you for this time you've given me. Am I using it the way that you would like me to? Have I responded to your grace in a way that pleases you? Do my actions give evidence that I am following you? So this communion time is a time to receive and enjoy the, the presence of each other and Jesus. And it's also a time in which we can really evaluate our hearts. So in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to come. And I'm going to ask you to come out on your left, come forward, receive the elements, and return back to your seats on the right. For those of you who need a gluten-free option, we have those right here in the center. First Corinthians says, 
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for your grace. We receive these elements, Lord, with grateful hearts, and we desire to respond. We invite you to come, Lord, to come with us to the table, because we want to be in your presence. We love you so much, Lord, and we just want to say thank you. Amen.